This episode is brought to you by Speroni. Revolutionize your shop floor with Speroni, where cutting edge technology meets craftsmanship. Elevate precision, amplify productivity. Speroni, experience, tradition, the future. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on to your hats and brace yourselves for an electrifying conversation on this episode of the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. We've got an international man of mystery, a modern day renaissance guy who's jet setting from the Motor City to the Swiss Alps. Give it up for none other than Stephen Antelix. Now, let me tell you, Stephen isn't just your run of the mill executive. This Detroit native and University of Michigan alum started off navigating the choppy waters of ocean shipping and digging deep into the natural resources game. From The Hague to London and Geneva, he's been shaking things up in all kinds of industries for over 15 years. You think he's done? Not even close. Stephen is currently the chief of staff at Industrial Next, a San Francisco-based startup that's revolutionizing the scene with smart automation and robotics. We're talking Tony Stark-level innovation here, folks. But wait, there's more. When he's not orchestrating business deals or coding the future, Stephen's flexing his literary muscles as the president of the nonprofit Geneva Writers Group. That's right. From numbers to narratives, this guy does it all. So get ready for a globetrotting journey of business insights, industry disruptions, and maybe even some po poetic wisdom. Strap in, because this episode is going to be one for the books. Stephen Antelix, welcome to the show. Hello, Stephen. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are you doing? Hello, Jim. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I'm doing really well, especially after that very upbeat intro you gave. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And, and you're joining us from far across the pond today. Uh, tell us where you are right now, Stephen, because I'm not going to do it justice. No worries. Uh, I live in a small suburb in France, just outside of Geneva, Switzerland. So even though it's an international border, I mean, I grew up in Detroit. So if you look at the map where the Canadian city of Windsor is across the Detroit River, when I used to work in Geneva, that was roughly my commute. It takes like maybe 25 minutes to get into the city by car. Um, wow. I'm actually lucky because I live on the easy side. There's a, the Center for European Research, like nuclear research, CERN, where they did the large yeah. Hadron Collider and all that stuff. That's on the other side of, there's a river that splits Geneva. And that side, the traffic is unbelievable. Like somebody that lives an e equal distance away from Geneva, it probably takes them 45 minutes to an hour to get in every day. So, because the UN is oh also on that side. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's wow. a very convenient location. So I yeah. really, really like it. Like living That's here, awesome. and some of the best seeing in the world is like forty-five to sixty minutes from my door. So. Well, that that sounds real rough. I grew up in in Colorado, <laughs> up in northern Colorado, and and grew up skiing nice. uh, in Steamboat Springs, uh, which you know, growing up, we were really proud of. And we used to say it was the Alps of Colorado. I don't know if that's true or not, because I haven't skied many other places. But that sounds beautiful, man. I, I, I love yeah. that area. I love that spot in the world. Um, so it sounds it sounds gorgeous. Um, so to kick off today's conversation, tell us a little bit about Industrial Next. What do you guys do there? Um, how many people work for, for the organization? What, what's going on? So, uh, yeah, Industrial Next came uh, about, well, we incorporated in November of 2021. Uh, and right now we have about just under 50 full-time employees. We've got a lot of interns that have come and gone over the, the summer months, so those are winding down. Um, but yeah, we're just under 50 people. We're already pretty spread out internationally. So we have an office in Shuzhou in China. Um, we have an office in Boston. Uh, we have an office in San Francisco, and then I'm based out here. Um, so yeah, basically what we're trying to do or what we have been doing, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we're working on is still at the prototype and testing phase, uh, came out of some of the stuff that the guys learned about when they worked at Tesla, because, so I'll give a quick bit, bit of background and then talk about the tech. Um, when they worked at Tesla, a lot of the team members that are on the, the startup have worked together before at Tesla and a couple other places. And one of the things they noticed is like, they were, you know, my buddy that, founded the company, he noticed things like, you know, they were building these very elaborate 
very sophisticated self-driving digit systems for the cars. So if you've read about what Tesla can do, I mean, he was looking at things like gait analysis. So a human being walking mm -hmm. on the street, their gait, the way they walk is almost as unique, or even, I think he said it was actually more unique than a fingerprint. And the wow. camera, because it has like a wireframe skeleton, it can look at that and decide, like the, the algorithms can actually figure out that before you even start turning your body, you're going to step onto the crosswalk or something, right? So it can start breaking the car. That's how it's so fast. I mean, it processes stuff quickly, but it also anticipates in a very sophisticated manner. So he was in charge of like, you know, wiring up the cameras and dealing with some of the coding and things like that. And when Tesla had the very well publicized Model 3 ramp up issues and people weren't getting deliveries, it was kind of an all hands on deck. They had to, you know, engineers of any stripe were called down to the factory floor to help out in any way they could. And he goes down to the factory floor and he told me it felt like, I don't know, going back to 1950, but people were sitting there with sledgehammers or crowbars, like banging <laughs> on parts and machines and like, you know, trying to trying to do this by hand. And he's thinking like, wait a minute. He's like, you know, we're, we're building these super sophisticated cars and systems. And yet the way we're building them is like, so not, <laughs> it's just right. not as sophisticated. And so he had this germ of an idea that kind of percolated for a while. And, uh, you know, he made out pretty well uh, working at Tesla. He worked at Waymo for a while, which is part of Google. Um, and he finally, the idea got the better of him. He said, you know, we should we should be taking some of the end technology and using it, kind of, you know, closing that loop and bringing it back into the factory to make the production processes more sophisticated. So things like, you know, you could have a smart camera and you can put it on the end of a robot and the robot can then build a map of where it is in space. And you can do it even without GPS. You can use things like LIDAR, radar, uh, and vision. You can do most things with vision. Um, and in the factory environment, it's relatively low light and it's relatively bad in terms of connectivity for things like Bluetooth or wireless or things like that. So th the simpler you can make it and, and then the more like, you know, um, focused you can make the solution, it can be very adaptable. And that's kind of the core idea is that you start with vision, just like humans, robots need to quote unquote, see things. Um, and we're trying to get the robot to dynamically understand where it is in space so that you can tell it, you know, in the old days, what you would do is you'd program a robot. You'd say, listen, you have to move ahead, you know, 20 inches or 30 centimeters or whatever. You have to move left, you know, like those old Apple computers with like the turtle and the go-to and turn right 90 degrees. <laughs> and that's how, that's how most robotics are coded. Um, because a lot of the coding is done by technicians rather than like software engineers. And it's very, very, you know, kind of regimented. And if the tolerance is out by a couple centimeters, it doesn't, you know, pick up the windshield. It just pushes the arm through it or it just stops and goes, you know, got to fail out. I can't, I can't do it. So what we're trying to move away from is that to a more dynamic situation where the robot can actually say, okay, there's a glass or there's a screw. Is it the right screw? And it actually is able to identify the part move to the part, pick it up and do whatever action. And you can just, you know, have the robot learn through AI, which is the other component that has really come, uh, you know, it's become much more sophisticated in the last even five years. Um, yeah. You can have that robot learn instead of showing it, you know, a thousand photos of a defect or a thousand photos of the right bolt, you could show it 10 and it can pick up, okay, I need to, I need to pick up that size bolt and it's a three quarter inch, not a half inch or whatever. So that's that's kind of the genesis of the company. The, the the foundation is vision because all of the things that we're building are kind of based off of being able to see better in the factory. Um, but our vision is bigger than that. Um, you, you have to start somewhere. And the vision is that, you know, long term, we build a solution that's a bit a little bit like you could almost think of it as manufacturing as a service. Instead of just being a contract manufacturer where somebody calls us up and say, hey, I need you know, 50,000 widgets by next year, what they do instead is they say, listen, like for, you know, let's take an example, there's the next Tesla and they're having a ramp up problem. Instead of having a bunch of engineers go down and jury rig a whole bunch of expansions to the line, they could call us up and say, listen, we need to expand capacity by, I don't know, 100 or 500, you know, cars a month. What can you do for us? And we ship them some packages of workstations, cameras, uh, AI systems in a container or something. X number of containers, depending on how many units they need to, to ramp up to. And then they just unpack that. And within a few, I don't know, a couple of weeks or thereabouts, they can just ramp up their production instead wow. of 
you know, the kind of retooling process, which can take months, you know, in a, yeah. even in a modern factory, because as you know, um, and I'm sure most of your listeners know, like the, one of the big secrets in manufacturing is that the, you know, if you look at the end to end process, you know, people look at some of the videos out of the Tesla Kiga factory in like Berlin, where there's like a drone flying through and like the stamping is automated and you know, there's all these machines yeah. around. But if you look at the whole process across all of manufacturing, you know, estimates vary, but it's definitely between 10 and 20% of the actual total process is automated. So there's a lot that can be done yeah. better. Uh, <laughs> it can be done more safely. It can be done faster. And a lot of that automation is around things like general assembly, where people are still physically fitting brake pads in or windshields or things like that. So again, giving the foundation that we're building, giving robots a vision, you know, it, it helps create an environment where that robot is much more dynamic and flexible. It's not necessarily, you know, we're not trying to replicate like the human hand. Like people ask us to like, oh, can you do a custom end effect for a robot that's like a hand? But people are kind of wedded to this is how we've been doing it. So let's replicate the way we've been doing it. But it's not necessarily the optimum setup for that particular manufacturing process. So we're trying to coax people away from those kind of embedded biases of like, well, you know, this person is able to pinch their fingers together and get that wrench in to get this little screw or whatever. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. what if we rethought that process and just said, okay, what if the robot could learn and, and actually provide feedback and tell you like, hey, this is a really awkward position. Why don't we change it? So like, instead of, I don't know, the screw pointing slightly down because then it falls off the end because it's heavier than the magnetic tip or whatever, it could be slightly pointed up if you just did X, Y, and Z. So with AI, I'm not saying AI will just, you know, tell you that, but with better analytics over time, you can get a situation where, you know, the, the feedback you get from the robots that are making helps actually make that manufacturing process more efficient over time. Yeah. So yeah, awesome. that's, that's kind of what we're aiming at. It, it, in, in very colloquial terms, it's kind of like the machine builds the machine. That's, that's kind of how we've been phrasing it. And that's awesome. And and before we we started recording, we were talking, to, and I uh, I I didn't know that Industrial Next actually is the one making uh, these workstations, yep. right? So not only are you guys conceptualizing this, but but you're actually building these workstations. Tell us a little bit about that and, and that you know uh, machines making machines concept. Yeah, so we we have a big software team, obviously, for the AI stuff. We also have quite a few hardware guys. They're based out of Austin, mostly. We've got people in China that are, you know, just co-located with a lot of the suppliers and things like that. Um, but basically, we are physically building prototype models of a workstation. And again, so Vision is foundational. We actually build, design and build the cameras the same as Apple. So it's it's physically made in China, but the workstations are actually made in the U.S., um, and the workstations are, so the camera itself is, you know, we don't want to be just a camera company, right? Like that's, that's one of the, the kind of concerns we had with the company is that if we start with the camera, then people will just, you know, box us in and say, okay, this is just another camera company. And we want to make sure people understand that there's more to us. And one of the ways we do that is by building these workstations, which use the cameras, um, but they also offer something that I think is very valuable. And that talks a bit about manufacturing culture is that a lot of people are afraid of straight up automation, like yeah. taking a process that's mostly manual and flipping it to 100% automated. And we say, okay, we can do that in six months. People freak out a bit because it's not what they're used to. And, and it's, it's risky. So the workstation gives us an inroad to people who might otherwise be skeptical because the workstation can be set up so that it's 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 very simply made. Um, right now, it's made out of eighty twenty, but we're actually moving to a, a custom solution that um, we you know we think it's going to be better than pretty much anything on the market because most things are made out of eighty twenty. Even that Tesla ramp up yeah. people are using eighty twenty for everything. Um, but basically, there's like four little screws, and you can take the top off and you can use it as a workbench. So you could do a fully manual process. You can put the top on, it's like a hood, and it has LEDs for, you know, status lights, or you can, you know, set it to you know, do whatever kind of lighting you want, so LEDs. Um, and inside that hood, you've got a couple screens for monitoring, so you can, like, look at the steps in the process or see if there's a backlog. And then you can create a hybrid workstation out of that workstation setup, so you could put a small robot arm or a small conveyor or something and have a person, you know, using a cobot, or you could have that station 
physically, you know, it's like a two foot by two foot type square thing. You could have it run by itself or in a, in a series fully autom- autonomously. Wow. So the workstation that we're building, um, it's, it's core to that idea that like, I mean, there's a, there's kind of this buzzword around things like micro factories mm-hmm. and modularity. And, you know, we were at this automate show in Detroit earlier this year. And like a lot of the modules are super expensive and they're like Lego bricks. Like you can't take the Lego brick apart. Like what you buy for one or $200,000, it's this, it's the fixed thing. And you can like put whatever kind of like robot arm or conveyor belt inside it that you want. But if, you know, your production needs, if they change, it's really hard to change that thing. And uh, one of the investors we have that's, that's on the board was saying, you know, he's invested in a lot of factories and done turnarounds and things. And he says, and he's, he was an engineer by training, but he spent the last 20 years as a lawyer. So he's you know, out of the loop in that sense. But he was like, we were telling him about this and we were, we were saying how people buy this super expensive tech and then they don't know what to do with it when their manufacturing needs change. And he's like, oh yeah, he goes, literally every single factor I've ever bought when I walk around, there's always some dark back room. <laughs> there's, there's all this like super specialized, super expensive equipment that's the latest and greatest and it's supposed to be flexible. But, you know, because they spent so much on it, they're like, well, we can't just toss it out. But the amount of money to like retrofit it is so expensive. And that's kind of what the workstation is trying to change and to address is that if you buy, let's say, 10 of these things, right? If you buy, so I'll do a quick comparison. So you buy 10 Lego bricks, as I'll call them, from the traditional quote unquote modular workstation. If you get an order for, you know, 5,000 widgets this year, you set it up for that 5,000 order and it cranks them out and you get it, whatever. Next year, you slightly change the product based on, you know, consumer demands or whatever. And you realize that two of those 10 stations, you don't need any more. You need to revamp them. You have to call the guy. They have to come out. They have to retrofit the whole thing. Um, maybe they just scrap it and replace it with another one or whatever. So it's a very expensive, labor intensive there's a lot of coding. Uh, a lot of the companies either outsource so that you basically deal with consultants rather than the OEM. And uh-huh. so, you know, it, it's just really a hassle. What we're envisioning is that if you buy 10 of our workstations and you, you know, you set 10 of them up to like, let's say, I don't know, three are manual, three are hybrid, the other, are, you know, fully autonomous. If the next year your needs change, you can just order some small robot arms and do it yourself. You can contact us and we can send you the parts, but you don't need to repurchase, you know, the, the two that might change out of the 10. You can just take the hood off, do whatever you need to. Um, and, and that way you don't lose the investment in that material, which yeah. a lot of people are doing. And, it, you know, it might not be the make or break for companies, but it's a significant additional cost that people are not able to recover. And again, that that, that feeds into the manufacturing mentality of, I don't want to fully automate because when I fully automate, I lose flexibility because human labor is in many parts of the world, relatively inexpensive and it's flexible. It can do things that machines, you know, it takes a lot of, I mean, you saw like Boston dynamics and those, those robots from like, I don't know, uh, Samsung or whatever, like, or some of the Japanese companies that were, you know, it took like decades of research to get a robot to walk. Like (laughs) people can just walk after, you know, you know, <laughs> go from this place to that place in the factory. And it's like making a robot that can walk and not fall over, really hard. <laughs> Getting a person for $10 an hour to do it, really trivial. Right, so of course, exactly. people prefer one versus the other. So yeah, that's, that's a very long-winded answer. That's what we're trying to change. With the, you know, we physically build these products. They're made in the States. It's, you know, you can order all these parts. There's tons of people that provide things like 8020 and similar type of, of raw materials still in the U.S., especially in the Boston area. Um, and, and again, assembling them, like I was, I, mean, um, I was trained slightly as an engineer, but not fully, um, assembling it is just like a workman, workman task. It's not super complicated. And that's the yeah. idea. And the idea is that the workstation is super simple. Uh, not a lot of moving parts, not a lot of building with, and also the software behind it is meant to be, um, I know this phrase is very much in vogue, but you know, no code, obviously there's some coding, but the idea is to minimize any kind of you know, going into the settings kind of thing and just doing stuff with the interface, um, what we call the HMI, the human machine interface, and making it very intuitive, very easy. Um, like a lot of the existing robot arms on the market, you can like teach it how to do emotion just by like setting it to, I guess, I don't know the exact term, but like you set it to basically neutral, you grab it with your hand and then you position it to like, you know, if you have to grab something from a rack and then put it on a conveyor, 
you're like, okay, here's position one, you put it where the rack is, here's position two, you put it on the conveyor or whatever, and then it just like mimics that motion. So we want to have stuff that simple where you just, you know, you show it what you, what to do, and then it just does it. That's uh, awesome. Rather than having to call a consultant and have to come out to code something. Yeah. That's awesome. I like that a lot. Uh, so Steven, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, sure. What, well, let's talk about the culture at industrial next before we really dive into more about, uh, automation robotics and its impact on culture in, in the industry. Let's talk about industrial next specifically, uh, it being a, you know, relatively new startup, uh, you know, almost two years or just over two years, I guess at this point, um, to be at 50 employees already, uh, that's that's some pretty scaled growth. So where was the culture when the organization started and where is it now? And really, where where do you guys see the, the culture of the organization getting to in the future? Sure. So, um, I mean, where we started is very easy. It was literally in my buddy's living room. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we moved to a... Uh, we literally moved to a garage, like our, our office in San Francisco used to be a, a motorcycle repair shop. Really? Um, actually, the guy that came out to install the, the Bay Area security lockdown, he was commenting that he used to bring his bike here uh, when, he was, <laughs> when he was a repair shop. Um, and actually, before that, you know, to be to, to, to earn your explicit rating, <laughs> before that, it was a sex club. Uh, so we still have like blackout curtains on the windows and stuff. No Which kidding. Pretty, pretty That's funny. awesome. No, it was great. <laughs> yeah, we had a. When I was cleaning the the workspace. We had like a grate in front of the with like a garage door thing, and I was sweeping it out and stuff. And these two guys, gay guys, came by and they were like, um, "Oh yeah, hey man, I remember when this place was was something different." I'm like, "Oh yeah, we know it was sex club, whatever." It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really fun. And he's like, "What are you guys doing here?" It's like we're building robots. He's like, "Are they going to be sex robots?" And they're like, <laughs> "Yeah, sure, man." <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe in the future we'll uh, we'll expand into that market, but yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. San Francisco is a, a very quirky place, so. Um, but yeah, so we literally started in the living room of my of my. I've known Lucas, uh, the founder, for about twenty, almost twenty years. We met at, at university, um, and so obviously, as with most startups, it started pretty informal, uh, jumping around a lot, and yeah. uh, you know the culture we want is is. It, it's difficult because and I'll, I'll give you a little. Uh, we can talk a bit more later if you want, but I'll, I'll give you one little brief vignette from my my career because I've worked internationally my basically my whole adult life. And one of the interesting things was we we did this like cultural diversity training, and it's not something that you know in the U.S. it tends to be very kind of by the numbers in a way. But when you yeah. work internationally, you realize that there's there's a very heavy bias towards certain things. And and for example, we talked about you know cultural sensitivity and respecting people's cultures. And it's like you know somebody made this question like, okay, well, what if somebody comes from like a hardcore Muslim country, right? Like they're they're literally living under Sharia law. So if they come into the office and they, they see women without headdresses or they're not you know they're not with a male chaperone, should we be respecting that culture or not? And it really stung people because it's not a you know. It's yeah. not a clear cut answer to say, oh, well, this culture is objectively better or worse. I mean, humans don't right. work that way when it comes to these things. So I say that because already, even though we only have 50 people and I only, uh, we had a very good pre, pre-seed funding round. We managed to raise 12 and a quarter million. Uh, wow. So the that's company amazing. valuation. Congratulations. Was, yeah, yeah. The company valuation. Thank you. The company valuation was sixty post cash, uh, which is which is pretty high for a hardware company. Um, yeah. And we actually in twenty twenty one we had one of the twenty twenty one. I think the funding round closed in April twenty twenty two, and so we actually ended up from what we know publicly, it was one of the best best results in Silicon Valley for that year. And then obviously there was that mini dip with the whole um, the Silicon Valley Bank and all that right. that happened and things like that. But but we had very good timing. We had a very very good good uh good round and so you know a lot of the people we've hired are you know i don't think lucas or alan the the, the other co-founder like i don't think they're actually you know taking a salary so to speak they're you know they're just basically doing things at cost at this point because they're both pretty, mm-hmm. you know they were both pretty successful and things like that and you know i'm i'm doing it for less money than, than i was in my previous job because I, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm banking on the kind of longer term vision of the sure. company uh, yeah, and the shares, obviously, as everyone <laughs> does with, with startups. Um, but yeah, just to, just to get back to the thing about the culture, like so, you know, 
the two co-founders between them have five different nationalities. So Alan is Taiwanese and Canadian, and Lucas was born in Poland, moved to Germany when he was very young, and recently became an American citizen. Wow. Like I'm That's also cool. Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. I'm also Hungarian and American. We've got a Russian guy living in Canada. We've got other Americans with us. We've got a couple of Canadians. Uh, we've got a couple of British people, an Irish guy. And then, of course, we've got a lot of people in China working for us. Yeah. So already we're having to navigate stuff that, you know, companies like Microsoft didn't necessarily have to deal with this because day one, they were like literally in a garage all in the same space. Now we've got, you know, three major time zones. We've got several different major cultures in terms of how they approach business and things like that. And so we're trying to, as best we can, navigate that and, um, you know, kind of find the best middle road. Because like in China, it's the Wild West. Like, you know, things, <laughs> things are done super quick. Um, it's not process driven, so to speak. It's, you know, going out and having beers or whatever and, and making deals and things. And, you know, in, in places like Europe, where I am, I mean, yeah, of course, you go out to dinners and things, but like, it's a lot more contractual and it's a lot more rigid and things are done a certain way. And, you know, sure. after the third meeting, do you use the informal? And then the fifth meeting, you ask for the money or whatever. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to do our best to, to toe the line between trying to get the best out of those different approaches to doing business. Um, and also the other thing is, and I don't think this maybe gets talked about as much. I obviously haven't listened to every podcast episode you've done. Um, but there is, and, and this is from back from my engineering days, uh, when I used to work on the solar car project at U of M, the, the different disciplines within engineering have their own cultures. And I'm not just, Absolutely. you know, it, it, yeah, the biggest one being the software versus the hardware guys. I mean, yeah. like that, it, you know, the fact that all of our hardware guys, for the most part, at least on the design side, are based in Boston and the people executing those designs are in China. So you have two cultures there of like, you've got the, the attitude towards business, but then you also have the different, the way that they're teaching engineering there. And then of course you've got to make that with the software. Cause one of the things we're trying to do that I didn't quite mention before is uh, I think your listeners will probably have, have kind of caught on to it a bit. Um, we're kind of vertically integrated. We're, developing both hardware and software solutions. So like the smart camera doesn't work without the software behind it. And, sure. and the camera itself, one of the major selling points is actually the fact that you don't need to tether it to a giant, you know, workstation. It mm-hmm. has onboard computing power. So it can like, it's, it's quite flexible in that you can deploy it. You, know, you can put 10 of them are in a circle around a, a part. And, you know, instead of taking the part, you could have the camera do like a 360 pictures of whatever that part and look for defects and things like that. So the idea is that it's cheap, it's light, uh, and it's more easily deployed than having these massive cables snaking all over your, your infrastructure inside the factory. So yeah, the culture between the guys developing the software and some of the things that are, you know, <laughs> our co-founder Alan likes to say things like, oh yeah, the software guys could do this in like two weeks, but you know, it's going to take two months because they're lazy basically, right? I mean, <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> But there is that culture of like the hardware guys are like, oh, this is easy. And the software guys are like, oh, this is easy. And you're like, no, you're both wrong. <laughs> like, this is complicated. That's the reason no one's done it before. <laughs> it's a complex thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's uh, that's a good insight into the organization as uh, in itself. Um, talk to us a little bit more about uh robotics automation and the manufacturing industry in general how do you think that uh these tools because really to me that's what robotics and automation are are tools how can they help foster a, a healthier better more positive company culture in the the manufacturing industry yeah, I think that there is a lot of opportunity for that. And I'll actually use an anecdote from uh, from my time in Boston office when we were assembling some of the workstation prototypes. Like, if you've ever worked with 8020, like those little, I don't know a technical term for the connectors, but like, you know, little nuts and bolts literally of like getting your fingers in there and like the thing shifting and then it dropping off. And like, it's an absolute pain in the ass. And yeah. everyone who's ever worked with 8020 knows that. And one of the things I realized is that... Uh, I, uh, I didn't know. It was a realization that I came to is when you have one of these trade shows, like all these advanced automated robots, it, it calls to mind that story I said about Lucas going down to the Tesla floor. Yeah. Um, 
we we moved our stuff in like i think the show started on a monday and we moved you know move in like I don't know, we arrived on friday night and we set up on saturday and then did like fine cleaning on sunday or whatever people came a week early like professionally we're a startup like we have like we had like three people there like assembling our stuff and we had pretty nice looking kit to be perfectly frank like it looked almost production grade um but like the people that set up like the pro stuff, like they have teams and they pay people and there's like a, you know, a large number of people coming in and it takes them a week to set up those things. So yeah. when we talk about automation, like if, you know, one of our goals in that Boston office is that there's a space next door that we would like to set up a demonstration factory so that the, the tools that we're building could be built by the tools that we're building so that you could take <laughs> these workstations, put robot arms in them, put conveyor belts in them and set it up to build cameras and build workstations like next door. And then what we could do, one of the things we're, we're aiming for, if, if we're lucky by next year, but maybe more realistically the year after, is to go to one of these automation shows, bring some of our workstations with us, right? Set them up and literally make production parts for a customer order. Oh, to show awesome. people that, hey, we took these workstations from our office, we packaged them, we brought them over, we set them up, and they're making things. And they're like, oh, those are cool demos of prototype units. Like, no, that's a customer order that's being done. That's how flexible our solution is. So when we talk about automation and manufacturing culture, like you mentioned uh, when we were talking before the show about things like the, the, the three Ds, like the dirty, the dull, the dark, the dangerous, all that stuff. For yeah. me, there's one D, and this is from my office time, is it's dehumanizing. Uh, this work is work that nobody grows up wanting to do. Like one, one of the tasks that we have been looking to replace with our automation in the demo unit, there's a fender coming out of a conveyor belt. And it is the job of three people, you know, 24 seven shifts. So three, eight hour shifts, mm -hmm. three people devote their entire eight hour shift to picking that, you know, fender off of the conveyor belt and putting it on a rack. <laughs> That's it. That's their entire job that they get paid for. And like, that is not speaking to the best qualities of human, humanity. It's just right. not. Nobody, nobody, nobody in third grade when the teacher says, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Goes, I want to move part A to bin B. Like, nobody <laughs> cares about that. It's, it's, it's not work. You know, it reminds me, I, I right. once did an interview with a company that made bowling balls in the U.S. And bowling balls are made out of, like, oh, I don't know. There's a whole lot of chemical stuff behind it. But, like, it's basically plastic resin, right? Right. And they... <laughs> They had this thing like, they, so the interview was in their factory and they walked us around because I studied industrial engineering. And so they walked us around and they were like, you know, there's a guy that's paid eight bucks an hour. This is back in like 2004 or something. There's a guy that's paid eight bucks an hour and he's called the drip cup operator. And there's a little little spout, like you think like on a tea kettle, tea kettle or something. And it pours the, yeah. the resin into the mold and then it tips up, but some of the resin drips. And if it drips into the mold, it can mess with the mold. If it gets on the outside of the mold, whatever. So like they literally have a guy standing there with like a, like a red solo cup type thing, <laughs> catching the excess dripping and like pouring it into a bin catch. And that's all he does. And the guy that was doing the interview said, if any of you can come up with a way to get rid of this, we'll hire you on the spot. <laughs> and the guy had several patents of like bowling ball designs, like the three dimensional wow. figures, right? Like the, the, the shape, sorry, inside the bowling ball. Like that stuff is, is insane. Cause you've got rotation, you've got all this stuff of like, you know, the weight is slightly off center, but then it's like, so, like, these are smart people, right? Yeah. And, and the process is, you know, it's, it's just typically there are some things that are difficult to get right. And those are the kinds of things where, you know, general assembly is still mostly done by hand. Like, we're not trying to make automated presses. Like, that stuff's been, been you know, the nth degree of, of, of efficiency has been squeezed out of processes like that. What we want to get away from is, you know, companies like Tesla being sued for repetitive stress injury because... Not only do they, you know, and it's not just Tesla, don't get me wrong, I'm just using them because it's yeah, yeah, yeah. familiar with, but it's, you know, common to all manufacturing. You know, people use people, uh, and it's not necessarily ergonomic, or it's not necessarily, I'm not saying it's unsafe, but, you know, you do the same thing over and over, just like typing a keyboard or, you know, twisting a torque wrench, it'll it'll wear on you. Um, and, and part of that reason, too, is, and, and this goes back to why we want our solution to be kind of, I, I think it goes with territory, relatively low cost, but also mm -hmm. simple. Um, easy to manipulate or, or reconfigure because a lot of times what happens with that specialized machinery is that when it breaks down, there's nobody on hand that knows how to fix it because it was bought, you know, through a third party or whatever. And by the time you get somebody there, 
you know, Tesla doesn't make money because it's a manufacturing process. It, it, as good as it is, none of the manufacturers in any industry make money because their manufacturing process is what's making them money. It, it can lower cost of production, but they get money from making units go out the door and selling products, selling cars, selling laptops, selling whatever. So if something breaks down that stops them being able to put product out the door, they're going to do with what they're going to go with whatever solution works, which is most often, right. hey, you eight bucks an hour, get on the line and do that thing until we can get somebody in to fix it. Right. And so these types of jobs, again, it's it's dehumanizing in the sense that it can it can wreck your body, but it's also dehumanizing in another way. And this is where my experience that isn't in manufacturing, there's a lot of parallels, is that you know in my career I've seen a lot of, you know. I'm trying to think of the right word for this. It's you, you kind of narrow the scope of people's jobs to where it becomes really easy because when, when people leave a job, it's difficult to find good replacements. That's true of everywhere from McDonald's to, you know, Boeing or the U S government, right? Like it's, right. it's, it's a universal thing that you lose knowledge. It takes time to train people and the job can be as remedial as flipping a burger or as complex as, you know, I don't know, piloting a, an F 16 or something, but yeah. it, you know, the organization loses when people leave. Well, why do people leave? Well, you know, if you look at a lot of jobs, and I've seen this in my career, is that things just get, you know, when, you, when email became a big thing, you didn't, you know, have a four-hour workday as a result. You did the job of what used to be four people. So in some yeah. senses, it spreads out. But in other senses, it becomes much, much more narrow. And, and that narrowness, and you see this in manufacturing, the guy that lifts the fender and puts it on the rack, it's, it's covering up a gap in the process that is inefficient. It's not been engineered correctly. And we have this a lot in office work too. You know, there's people that literally just, I don't know, they stamp uh, a physical piece of paper, right? Like that, yeah. the whole job is there. Why? Because, and I saw this in the shipping industry, you know, they don't accept electronic documents for a lot of things. So like the person that needs to sign can't sign. So they just find somebody and do this job. But, you know, you get all these little uh, offshoots of inefficiency, you know, in the, in your processes, because things are often not looked at holistically and you have it with knowledge work, you have it with manufacturing and you, you use people to plug these gaps and we get more and more gaps. You know, systems just become more and more complex with time. Like, you know, what used to take three clicks in windows 98 now takes 37 clicks because you have to accept and whether or not it's connected to the internet and kind of internet and your firewall not enabled and all this other stuff. And then you end up right. with people whose whole job it becomes just to like, paper over these little gaps and those types of jobs, whether it's sitting in an office, you know, doing that stamping or whatever, it's, it makes you feel like a cog, like the old Jetsons thing. Like you're just a cog in the machine and that's all you are. And then yeah. it's very easy to, to leave your job because you say, well, you know, I'm just literally punching this, this hole, whatever. I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to leave. But that has a reciprocal effect because then companies are like, well, crap, people keep quitting. So how can we make the job smaller in scope so that when they leave, there's less disruption. And so you have this feedback loop. It doesn't happen everywhere, but it's significant enough that I've seen it. And I see lots of it in the examples people tell me from, you know, the manufacturing experiences that they've had, where this type of work, as I said, nobody wants to be doing it. And people talk a lot about, oh, the manufacturing is stealing, you know, the automation in manufacturing is stealing our jobs and whatever. Those are the kinds of jobs that people would rather not do anyway. Like, who wants to grow up and no offense to them, but you know, who wants to grow up and be a janitor, right? Like it's not an aspirational job. It's a job of necessity and we should move away from yeah. that. Like there's no reason with modern tech that things should be this kind of, I don't want to say backwards. That's a disservice to the industry, but it, it, it shouldn't be this far behind the curve where I'll do a real quick anecdote. When I first started working out of BlackBerry, right. And at that point in time, like a BlackBerry was a super coveted item and like the laptop you would get from your company if you had a job that, you know, you, you're using a laptop was like, you know, super expensive and super high powered or whatever. But then companies were like, well, that's a lot of costs and then we'll just move things to the cloud, blah, blah, blah. And now in the span of my career, only, you know, 15, 20 years, I've seen the exact inversion of the, the, the laptop you get from a company or the mobile phone they give you is absolute garbage compared to yeah. your own personal tech. Like... I would never trade, a, a, you know, a company phone for my iPhone or whatever. Like my MacBook yeah. kicks the crap out of most companies' desktops, <laughs> let alone what they would offer you as, as, as a, a laptop. Right. And so we've seen that shift in our, like very, you know, not even, I wouldn't even say in our lifetimes, but I mean, in our lifetimes, yes, but our lives aren't over yet. So who knows where it's going to go. But in the last, I would say two to three decades max, 
you've seen the flip. The, 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 the most advanced technology you used to ever come in contact with was in the office or in the manufacturing yeah. space. And now it's at home. And it's one of the things, pocket. and when I say that manufacturing is behind me, it's, yeah, exactly. It's on your head. You know, you have these wearable devices yeah. now. And for, for me, the, the thing is, is that, that that has happened in office work. And it's been very kind of evident to anyone that pays attention or has that, you know, viewpoint. What manufacturing has been left behind by is that they used to live in a world where consumer products were cheap plastic garbage, right? Like that right. was that was the viewpoint of most people that grew up around these massive robots or working at the big three or anything like that. Like, And the reality is that consumer products have often leapfrogged the in, quote-unquote industrial-grade products that are used in most factories now. And, and that's something people have not really taken advantage of. And that's something what we're trying to do. We're trying to do stuff low cost. I mean, the guys in Boston, they were looking at like conveyor belts, right? And like you go online, it's like a thousand dollars for like this conveyor belt. And they're like looking at this stuff and they're all very pragmatic guys. And they're like, yeah, okay. Or we could just buy a treadmill for a hundred bucks on Craigslist and we could use that because it's almost literally the same material. In fact, it's less reflective, which is better for our vision system. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it, there's a lot of stuff we used to call it in the mining industry gold plating right like yeah a quick quick anecdote there was a, a mine in mozambique that the company i worked for bought from a different company and they when we talk about gold plating the example was like okay this mine is in a remote area so they were going to like build a power line from south africa where mozambique gets most of its electricity across the border to this spot because they were going to mine this stuff and then they were going to build a port like a a a, a, a jetty into the Indian Ocean, which is like at that place, it's like super turbulent and whatever they were going to build. I think it was going to be like half a mile out or something like that. So a massive structure. For, and they're like, when, when the company that I worked for bought it, they're like, well, why don't we just ship it down the river? Like yeah. there's a river there. We can just use what's already there instead of building. So that's gold plating, right? Like reinventing the wheel, whatever kind yeah. of terminology you want to use. And unfortunately, manufacturing kind of unwittingly nobody nobody actively did it but like that's the that's the kind of situation we're in now is that we had a competitor come up to us at that automation thing and and he brought an engineer with him and the engineer was taking pictures of our camera with his phone asking how did we get a 48 megapixel sensor into such a small form factor and i'm sitting there with my you know relatively you know i'm a, I, maybe i'm a power user but i'm not an engineer by by trade any in, in any way and i'm looking at him i'm like Dude, your phone has a 48 megapixel sensor. Like, it's smaller than our camera. Like, how, like, how, you know, it's it's those embedded biases that we're trying to 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 get to the root cause of. Like, I'm sure that guy's a very good engineer. I'm sure he's good at what he does. But it's that blind sight of like, you're literally holding in your hand the answer to your question. Yeah. Like, the, the yeah. tech, we just took a consumer, a, a quote unquote consumer grade, you know, uh, image processor. And we shoved it into an industrial grade camera, quote unquote, because right. that's one thing Lucas, he, that's one of his pet peeves. He goes, I have yet to find anyone who can define industrial grade in, in, in a concise way. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's in the ether. It's, it's like what, what the, I think the Supreme Court of the U.S. was famous for saying, like, what's pornography? You'll know it when you see it. Like, what's industrial grade? Well, you'll know it when you see it. But that, right. those days are over. Those days are over. And people don't, you know, your iPhone now, you can drop it in the toilet. No problem. I, I had a boss at my one of my companies. He used to literally go swimming with his iPhone. Like he really? go swimming for like half an hour. With his, yeah, and he, it had no problem. So like, you talk about like, could you do that with an, a quote unquote industrial grade camera? No, <laughs> you know, the humidity is too high. It's like it throws a it throws a you know loop into the software or whatever. So again, it, it it it's a lot like you know if you look into patents and stuff, you can patent two things. You can patent something new. Or you can patent a new application of existing stuff, like a process, like, oh, you put these things together in a new way. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. The technology mostly, on the AI side, mostly not, but there's some little offshoots that we can use. But at least in terms of the hardware, like most of these problems have actually already been solved and people just didn't realize it. They just didn't see the forest through the trees. Because again, they were biased from that old mentality of, you know, we make these cheap disposable polaroid or whatever cameras and you take a click and whatever and then you throw it away and now right. you've got an iphone that you can record you know almost cinematic quality movies on and Absolutely. people are like okay or even you know a lot of people you're just doing a podcast but a lot of people on youtube 
they don't buy a video camera. They buy, they used to buy a very good digital camera that also does video. And now they just can do it with a, a mobile phone. Like I've seen yeah. interviews done just on the video of a mobile phone because it's gotten that good in you know the span of a decade. You don't have to spend as much. And again, manufacturing, it's just, there's a lot of old relationships with suppliers. There's old ways of doing things. And they just don't see that that world has changed. And we're trying to bring that change in and say, guys, look, we can actually, you know, we're not, we don't have to, like I said, we build our own stuff, but we're using off the shelf components for the most part. So, so do you think that there's, you know, yeah. do you think that there's certain aspects of uh, that traditional manufacturing culture that makes it more resistant to automation and robotics? And, and how do you think that we, we tackle that? That's a really interesting question. I, I'm not the best place person to answer that because I haven't spent my career in in in, in uh, manufacturing. But given 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 my experience at U of M when I when I did study engineering and I, I know the mentality. I mean, I still know a lot of guys who you know, as smart as they are, they really think they 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 truly deeply believe that the longer hours they work, the more value they create. Like right. it's a one to one correlation, and it, you know, every scientific study pretty much on the planet can demonstrate that after a certain number of hours, your brain just doesn't work as well. And what you end up doing is making more mistakes, not realizing it, and then coming back the next day and having to fix it or someone else having to fix it for you. I think that there is that, that mentality that Lucas saw of, of people like banging on stuff with sledgehammers. There, there's, there's a physicality to manufacturing that isn't in software and isn't in office work and isn't in service industries and i think there's a bias towards literally getting your hands dirty you know elbow grease kind of thing sure and i think when solutions come along that threaten that people people feel a psychological it, it, it's a low level threat but it's a threat in in the sense yeah. of like this is how i've defined who i am like oh those software guys might come up with something pretty but i'm going to get out there and i'm going to make it work because it's not it's not exactly fit for purpose and it's like this idea of like, oh, it's so cutesy, but it falls apart. It's like the idea of the, what was it like the, I can't remember. It was like the B2 bomber or something like where, when it was on the ground, or maybe it was the SR-71 Blackbird or something, but it was like a super, super advanced piece of kit. But when it was on the ground, it would just like pour jet fuel out because to a lay person or, or, you know, somebody that's like, well, that's just a waste. The reason was that when you got up to speed in the upper atmosphere, the fuselage would heat up so much that all those gaps would close. And so it basically wasn't a plane designed to ever really be on the ground or be optimal on the ground. But it wasn't like robust in the old sense of the term. Like I, I've often had this discussion. This is a bit of a tangent, but it's, it's related. I've often had this discussion with people about, you know, I always use that example of that Air France, I think it was flight 447 or whatever, the one that went down yep. over Brazil because yep. that pitot tube, basically one of the, two or four pito tubes froze and i i've i i watch a lot of these air crash investigations i love this kind of <laughs> I, I really do i i actually I, it's not the i'm not into like the gore oh my god mm -hmm. I, I really love the ntsb and their approach and the analytics and how they like go down i mean as you did before the podcast you know some people confuse my name with analytics so i do like <laughs> i guess a little bit um but i love how methodical they are right and, and one of the things that absolutely blew my mind, and I, I, like for anyone that doesn't know about it, I'll just do a 10 second recap is that plane has like 200 plus people on it. There's two experienced pilots and one less experienced pilot. One of the pitot tubes freezes and it gives an incorrect airspeed. The, the, the less experienced pilot pulls back on the joystick and this disengages the autopilot. And what I didn't realize was basically like they fell out of the sky for like, I think it was like five minutes or something. And he's pulling back on this joystick the entire time. And the other pilots don't realize he's doing it and that the autopilot's been disengaged and they don't have control and blah, blah, blah. By the time they realize that they're like below 10,000 feet, they can't recover. Wow. And so I thought, okay, the tube froze and all these people died for something. Mean. But the, the, the even more insane part of this story is that that pitot tube, it doesn't just freeze and that's it, game over. It actually has a heating mechanism. So it was only frozen for 90 seconds. So no one person, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it blew my mind. Like it was in one of his, you know, it wasn't a throwaway comment in the, in the video that I watched about it, but it was like going through the, you know, the official accident report, blah, 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 blah. So 
a 90 second gap in data caused a pilot who had, I mean, even though he was inexperienced, he had like, I don't know, two or four or whatever thousand flying hours. He, he made the wrong decision and he got locked into that wrong decision. And that caused him and all the people on board to, to perish. And we, we talk about robustness, like air travel is, is, and I'm not saying that, you know, air travel is super safe. Like I fly often, oh, yeah. Lucas is a big fan of flying and stuff. So I'm not trying to, I'm not saying anything about the safety industry. What I'm trying to make a point about is that we have gotten safer globally. So the, the entire industry as a whole of aviation is like super, super, super safe, right? But yep. we've lost something along the way. And what we've lost are, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a bit into history and stuff. And so like those old stories from World War II were like you had a B-17 flying fortress and it had four engines and it had, I don't know, seven crew and it went out on a sortie and it got shot up and it came back and it only had one of the four engines working and six of the seven crew are incapacitated or dead. And they basically patch it up and two hours later, it's back out into the fight going on another sortie. We've lost that robustness. And we've traded it of individual robustness, and we traded it for systemic robustness, which is cool. But when the thing is, is that when things happen outside the normal parameters, in the old days, there was enough, it's kind of the difference between analog and digital, there was enough flexibility or give in the system to actually allow people, you know, time to recover or to make mistakes. Now it's become so binary that like the moment you're not paying attention for an instant, poof, it's it's game over, yeah. and uh, my That's personal an view is analogy. not somebody. Yeah, I, I, what I'm trying, you know, my whole career, one of the things I've been really keen on is people talk about efficiency. I don't care. I care about effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Is the solution that you're making or we're making effective for the problem you're trying to solve? And it's one of those things. Like it just drives me crazy that like you know it, it, it's a feedback loop. Why wasn't the pilot trained well enough? You know, the whole thing, aviate, commu- uh, aviate, navigate, communicate, right? And he totally mm-hmm. flubbed the AVA part. How? And part of it is that you have these feedback systems that, as I said earlier about the dehumanizing nature of some of this work, pilots don't fly anymore. I mean, they can even land the planes automatically in many airports. So you start losing a bit of that edge about that, you know, that, that the thing that makes us better than machines about that, that quick intuitive reaction to something unexpected and it's it's my same i I have this discussion a lot with lucas and others because they come from the self-driving car world where i'm just like i'm not i'm not ready to accept it because you know you look at like the autobahn in europe right and these stories even go to the u.s where like you know there's fog on a highway in like germany or austria or something and there's like a hundred car pileup it happens almost you know every couple of years it always makes the news pretty much worldwide imagine if all the cars were self-driving and there was an outage in whatever system they were using. GPS went out or whatever. I know there's redundant systems, but let's just imagine there's, you know, as, as happened with the plane, something just goes awry that was unexpected. Instead of a hundred car yeah. pileup, we might have a thousand car pileup, you know? So it's like we, we trade, yes, of course, we're going to have a- autonomous driving is statistically much, much safer. However, when things go wrong, it's really hard to recover from those and things like that. So, to tie it back into manufacturing culture, the point I, I'm trying to make is that, and and it's, I guess we don't articulate it very often, and it's probably why it's taken me so many words to kind of articulate it, but we we have a fear as as a group of people, anyone that does a job like a pilot, like when you have fly by, by wire versus, you know, car or, or uh, planes that, you know, you could have more of a feel of the hydraulics. Same thing yeah. with cars when they went from manual to like uh, electric transmission. I remember my dad telling me about like how weird it was. You'd like turn the steering wheel one turn and the car would like, you know, m- the wheels would move all the way through the range of motion. It's like, that's <laughs> not how it used to be. And I remember he had an old, I think it was a 74 Firebird and that thing didn't have power steering. So it was like, <sighs> when you were like, barely moving it was like trying to i don't know like an arnold schwarzenegger thing we're like trying to get the wheel over but but there's something to be said for that so that's what i'm trying to say is that like manufacturing i'm not trying to denigrate them or say that you know they're wrong or whatever there is a value in that more analog approach of like using people the flexibility having that feel for the thing itself that you're building or whatever and when you automate and you make especially stuff with software you, you lose that feel and then you lose a little bit of your um, 
your specialty, your specialization, or your, your skill. Like you're trading, you're yeah. slightly becoming, you're in danger. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but when systems are designed suboptimally, let's just say as a general umbrella thing, people, people risk losing a little bit of that know-how and that tactility. And I think that's something that's really, um, yeah, in, in, in places like aviation, it can be dangerous. In places like automation, it can just be, or in manufacturing, it can just be inconvenient or it can be uh, costly and things like that. But those mistakes are costly. And, and just to, to round this out, like one of the things, um, like uh, Lucas drives a Tesla and he likes it. He likes the minimalist design. But one of the things I absolutely cannot stand about the interface is, you know, if I want to change the temperature control, I have to like go into a menu. I have to take my eyes off the road. Yeah. And there are, and the thing that hasn't been thought through, in my opinion, and again, I'm not digging on Tesla. I think they make a very good product. But there need, when I talk about effectiveness, Tesla's at one end of the extreme with like minimalist interior architecture of like the car. But, but is that fit for purpose? Some things are better with physical buttons like temperature control, volume mm -hmm. control, very, very simple basic tasks for which it's not worth the trade-off of I'm taking my eyes off the road. Yeah. And and we're trying to plug that gap by saying, oh, autonomous driving. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Because autonomous driving has, has issues as well. And then, so my, it, it's one of those things that just frustrates me. It's like typewriters, actually. Sorry for the other vignette, but like this QWERTY keyboard, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet about where it actually came up with, a lot, like whether or not the letters of a, of a physical typewriter, the, 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 the arms were hitting or getting jammed or whatever. But we're moving to things like uh, speech to text, but we've not optimized keyboards yet. We have no idea like, oh, I, you know, I can type like 80 or 100 words per minute on a, on a keyboard with a QWERTY layout. What if I'd learned to type on a keyboard that was optimized for the digital realm, not for the analog realm? Maybe I could yeah. type, I don't know, 140 words a minute, and then speech to text suddenly looks really crappy because it's not accurate even to this day. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where like it, it has its place, but usually it's it's something where, oh, okay, you know, closed captioning, fantastic application. Writing a novel, horrible application. <laughs> like, <it's> just, <laughs> so, you know, this is this is the kind of stuff I worry about. And in manufacturing, it's one of those things. Is what we're doing fit for purpose, or is it just something that you know you learn to do over time? And my first boss when I worked professionally had this great saying, and I'm sure it's not, I know it's not his, but he was saying, you know, somebody comes to you and they say, Oh, I've got 20 years of experience. You should ask yourself, is that 20 years of learning continuously and getting better and better every year? Or is it one year of experience repeated 20 times? Yeah. And I think in manufacturing, there is, I'm not saying it's universal, but there's a tendency towards the latter of the, it worked this way last year. I don't see why we need to change it. Well, let's, let's just keep going because it works and it's worked before. And the problem with that mentality is that it works right up until it doesn't. And then yeah. you're caught out and you're like, oh, crap, now I've got to automate my whole factory and I don't know how. And that's also to bring it back to our products. That's why that workstation is so important, because that workstation is a foot in the door that says, listen, you don't have to go all or nothing. You can do hybrid, you can do mix, you can test it out and it's low cost. It's flexible enough where you don't have to worry. Um, to, you know, you're not jumping into the pool head first into the deep end where it's freezing cold. You're going in, it's kind of room temperature, and you're just dipping your ankles in, and you acclimate, and you go a bit deep, and things like that. So that's really what we're trying to do is not do this big bang of like, here's, here's the factory in a box, and there you go, figure it out. But we're trying to ease people into it because I think, in the, you know, even though Lucas and I disagree some about things like self driving cars and some of the other things about tech stuff, I think the underlying impetus is there that we realize that people need an easier way to get their head around this stuff and an easier way to acclimate to this new environment where, yeah, you're going to trade a little bit of that individual, get down on the floor and grab a wrench and fix it versus having the computer tell you there's a problem and the computer also being able to solve that problem without you having to necessarily interact with the machine physically. So are there any ethical considerations that uh, companies need to take into account when adding more robotics or automation into their mix? Um, if I wanted to be PC, I would say that's about my pay grade, but I'll go ahead and answer that anyway. <laughs> it's, um, 
I think I think it would be those, you know, a lot of companies across many, many, many industries from Hallmark to what what have you, uh, talk about things like people are a foundation. Right. And, you know, I used to think that was a whole bunch of, you know, nice jargon too. And in some sometimes it is, but you know, I think about someone like Steve Jobs and I think about the fact that he just had an idea. And then he brought that. That was it. He had an idea. That's it. That, that's the only thing different differentiates him from anybody else. Is he had an idea. It was different, and he was obviously able to execute on that. And that's. I'm not trivializing it, but it. You know, as you get older, you kind of realize there's not like this big, physical monstrosity that is life or the world. A lot of it is. You know, Steve Jobs dies. Apple keeps going. Sometimes an entrepreneur entrepreneur dies, and his dream or his idea dies with him, and we may not have even ever heard about it. So like. Human ingenuity, human creativity, like that stuff ain't going away. Like even if we design AI that's as good as us, it will never be as good as us as we designed it. Maybe it'll be better than us, but it'll be better in some ways and it won't be fully human. Like I don't personally think that like a machine can quote unquote steal. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but you know, we'll see. But my point with this is that if you really believe that people are the foundation, then if you're going to automate, you should, you should... Let me go back to that guy standing in the factory moving the fender from the from the um, sorry from the conveyor belt to the to the rack. Yep. You, as his employer or her employer, should believe that that person is capable of more, because knowing nothing about them, I can guarantee you that they're more than just a bag of meat that picks up something and puts it there. They've got a brain, they've got intuition, they've got you know all this great all these great features of people no matter how intelligent or whatever, like we're still better than most machines in most tasks. Yeah. So you should be able to repurpose or retrain that employee to do something much more value additive, both for your company and for the sake of their development as a person and as an employee of yours. And you will benefit just as I said, with that reciprocal relationship of, you know, if you, if you whittle people's jobs down to narrower, narrower scope, then they're going to treat it like a disposable who gives a crap anybody can do this and they just check in and clock out and that's it. And it's that difference of that mindset versus let's have somebody who's, oh, this is a kind of woo woo term of like, you know, someone who's more fully actualized or, um, you know, using more of their potential because yeah. you will benefit as the employee and the employer will also benefit because you'll come up with ideas. You'll look at stuff and, and, and come up with new ways of doing things um, that the machines still won't be able to to figure figure out so yeah that's my in terms of ethics i think people should if if you're gonna if you're gonna save money because most of it is is cost saving through automation you get better efficiency you get better economy to scale and our solutions are no different in that regard like we're, you know we're trying to make money by you know chipping off those those savings as everybody does it's offering kind of a service but i think for companies that are purchasing that if you know let's say you're going to save i don't know hundred grand a year on this particular process and you're going to replace or you know two or three people are going to lose their jobs let's say that job being that very specific task then it would behoove you to spend i don't know 10 percent of that on a retraining budget rather than letting those people go full stop yeah so from an ethical so, point of view i think that yeah go ahead well i was just gonna you know you, you brought up a couple of things and and it just spurred a question in my head uh sure. do you think that robotics and automation can help and make uh, can help make the manufacturing industry more inclusive and diverse uh, going back to your previous comment about the different cultures that you've worked with but also you know the the dynamics and potential of people do you think that uh, these tools can help change the industry to make it more diverse and, and inclusive? Oh, without question, I do. Um, you know, as, as if, if factory work becomes more like knowledge work, then you'll see lower barriers to entry and you'll see fewer, you know, having grown up in the States, there was always that push towards women in engineering, especially we had a whole group called SWE, like the Society for Women in Engineering. Yeah. And ironically, I was a member because they couldn't discriminate based on gender. So that was pretty amusing. But you know, for a couple of us that did that just to, you know, engineers, you know, it's not like we're, we're Lotharios exactly. We're, <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take whatever tiny opportunity where we can find it. But um, it was, um, yeah, so there's, there's been a push because obviously, you know, if you look at women and men, when, you know, if you look at their educational histories, like women actually outperform men in mathematics and sciences up to a certain age. And then right. 
hormones and social pressures and stuff start taking some uh, some impact. I remember I uh, one of my cousins in Hungary. She uh, she works for a company that's kind of it's not quite robotics, but she does a lot of like real mechanical engineering, and she's significantly young. I think she's eleven years younger than me. And she she was thinking about going to university for for engineering, but then she was like. Um, you know, women women don't do engineering, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And she's like, oh yeah, yeah, well, look, it's hungry. Hungry is a little bit more traditional. Let's call them gender roles. I know yeah. all those terms are a bit bit in flux, but like, um, you know, men are men and women are women, and blah 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 blah. And I had gone to a, a university in Hungary for a study abroad program when I was a student, and I met a woman that I'm still friends with, who's an engineer. Her husband's an engineer. Um, and I was like, listen, I'll put you in touch with her. You can chat with her. I'm like, there's there's absolutely no reason if you like robotics and, and mechanical stuff that you should not be an engineer. And like, she credits me with helping her, you know, break out of that mold a bit. And I'm not trying to, you know, boost my, my ego by saying that. I'm just saying that the more barriers, you know, that grunt work, and that elbow grease, it has its place. Absolutely. But if you can just unlock the creative potential of people's minds, then everything is on a much more level playing field. It doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair, uh, if you're physically unable to like lift, uh, I don't know, a two by four or whatever. Um, it becomes more, are you smart enough to see the connections? Can you, can you figure out that if I optimize this process over here, that's actually going to make these other things easier, even though they're not directly related. Um, yeah. One example I like to give from a software thing, uh, I didn't start off working in IT, but my last couple jobs before I came to the startup were in IT, which I never ever in my life thought I would end up doing, but that's, you know, how <laughs> the international <laughs> that's how works. Some stuff works. works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, one of my, one of my professors used to tell me like, you know, in school, you're taught that there's like a linear, there's A and then there's B and then there's an output C. And he's like, in real life, there's just a bunch of squiggly lines and you don't have any idea. You're like, there's D and there's Z and there's F somewhere. And they're kind of, kind of I have no clue what's going on. So that's, that's the difference between school and life is that it's a lot messier and it's a lot less linear. But um, before I got into IT, I was working tangentially with some IT stuff. And I remember I went to uh, one of our offices and there was a guy there and he wasn't that great with, with computers. And somebody had set up an Excel sheet for him that was like, it had macros and all this other crap. And it was like super convoluted because like what he would do is he was trying to move containers of a certain product. I think it was nickel or something like that, like nickel ore. Uh, and he would send out a request for quote. And then all of these people would send an Excel sheets back with like, okay, this distance, this much cost, blah, 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 blah. And of course, all of those sheets were different. And so he, somebody wrote him a, a macro uh, in Excel to like take all those different inputs and put them into one sheet where he could actually compare the offers like for like and figure out who's just giving him the best deal. And I looked at this whole process and I'm like, you know, he stopped using the macro because he like the guy that had done it for him had like left the company and then it broke or whatever and he wasn't able to fix it. And like, I can write a macro. I'm not great. But, you know, I, I can do it. You know, it takes me some Googling and whatever, like many people, but you know, and I looked at this whole thing and I said, well, the problem isn't the macro. The problem is he doesn't understand who has leverage here because right. he's the person that's going to be paying the people. So I said, listen, why don't you make the spreadsheet in the format that you want it in and you send it out to those six or 10 companies. They fill it out, you bring it back, and then you just have like literally just copy paste it into a bunch of different tabs and you have like a master tab that just says, okay, you know, uh, uh, sell A1, I put it here, sell it, you know, and that way you know where all the data is. So yeah. the, the solution did not require more tech or better tech or anything. It just required, you know, I, I often say to people, there's three different P's that you can look at when you're trying to solve a problem. And this applies to office work, service culture, manufacturing, whatever. There's the people that are doing the job. You know, Bob yeah. always mistypes this letter. So maybe we should have him typing a different sentence that doesn't have that letter in it. Uh, there's the process. So, okay. If Bob comes after the copy editor, we should make it so Bob comes before the copy editor so that, you know, whatever. And then there's the program itself, which is where most people spend a lot of the time, but it's usually often the process and the people that are causing the issue more than the program yep. itself. Now, I'm not saying software programming especially is like, you know, I've got my own issues with it to, you know, ad nauseum. But the point is, is that there's multiple paths of looking, there's multiple right answers. And, and that's something that, 
like looking back on my my schooling, like one of the foundational experiences I had as a student was when I joined the Michigan Solar Car team, because it was there that you saw a couple different things. I mean, you saw the importance of business and sales. Like I've seen a lot of YouTube ads lately about how you know everything is sales and blah blah blah, and that's that's very true because even if you're working on a you know let, let's say you graduate school, you go into some manufacturing outfit, and I don't know, like that they're making the bowling balls. Like if you come up with a better idea for how to make that ball, well, you're not going to pour the resin yourself. Like you might be a mechanical engineer, not a chemical engineer, or you might be, you know, whatever. So you've got to sell other people. Like you've got to make a pitch. You've got to get them to buy in. You've got to get them to, to go to management and say, Hey, this is a good idea. We should do it like this one. It's not just up to you. So when you're on a team like this, you, you start seeing that, you know, there's a lot of like, negotiating, politicking, however you want to phrase it, that goes on into every decision, even technical ones. But the other, for me, one of the even more valuable things was to see how the different schools or disciplines of engineering are, have all these baked-in biases. So like if you're a mechanical engineer, you approach problems with a bias that you're not even aware of because all of your classes from freshman through master's or anything in between, you're always surrounded by other mechanical engineers and you're always solving problems with a mechanical engineering mindset. And when, when it came to solar car, we had this big whiteboard in the office uh, for the project. And it was basically this critical path, which in software I've heard talked about, but never actually seen an effective one that showed all the dependencies and things. Um, but for us, it was quite simple. Car has to race. What does it need? It needs headlights. It needs brakes. It needs a canopy. It needs you know, propulsion, whatever, tires, right. uh, all that good stuff. And so you had this big, you know, um, critical path of like, you know, if it doesn't have brakes, it can't race. If it doesn't have this, it can't race. And you had, you had problems for which, you know, there were no clear cut A, then B, then C solutions. Like for instance, the frontal area of the car, because solar cars are very light, they're very small, they're made out of carbon fiber, they weigh like, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds. So they can be buffeted around by the wind. And as anyone that knows anything about automation or automotive knows that, you know, as you get faster, air resistance is actually one of the biggest sources of drag because sure. it you know, goes up exponentially. And so uh, we did our best as students to try and reduce that frontal area of the car. And one of the ways you can do that is you can cover the wheel so that like instead of having spokes or whatever, you and you saw these on the first generation or second generation Priuses and stuff or the Honda Insight and things like that, mm -hmm. you, you cover that air gap so that you get better aerodynamic. But the problem is when you cover that air gap, well, now the tire can't turn as far and you need the tire to be able to turn a certain number of degrees to be you know, road legal and things like that sure so there's a problem how do we get you know do we just make them wide or whatever and we came up with the solution of cutting what we call windows into the fairings that cover the, the tire and when the driver would turn the steering wheel these would pop open okay. interesting elegant solution works whatever how do you actuate that popping open well the mechanical engineers of course wanted a mechanical system the electrical engineers, of course, wanted an electrical system. <laughs> and, you know, the aerospace engineers that were looking at the aerodynamics had a different way of coming at the problem. And so you had three different solutions. Well, which do you pick? Right. There's no right answer. There's no, it has to be, you just look at them, you weigh the option. And, and for, you know, when we talk about things like manufacturing, that's what I'm talking about with these biases about consumer products. Like, it's, it's not a fault of the mechanical engineering curriculum that a mechanical engineer has a mechanical engineering bias. That's kind of the point. And I'm not blaming or saying anyone's at fault for the state of manufacturing in most places of like, you know, a lot of manual work, general assembly and stuff, because it was a legitimate, you know, it made people money, it, it gave people career fulfillment or whatever. And people just didn't realize how much more advanced some of the consumer tech especially has become. And when I worked on a project like that, that was the kind of eye opening thing was like that you come at this, these problems and you can, you can solve them in a variety of ways. And that's kind of that, that openness, uh, that's kind of what we're trying to capture. And that kind of feeds back into our company culture as well. We're trying to be open. Uh, we're trying to respect people's cultures. We're trying to be, you know, not these culture of like, you know, work 24 seven or whatever, like people, yeah. we have unlimited time off, but you know, we, we think people are adults and they can, you know, flex off. Act like you know, adults. Just like manufacturers <laughs> ramp up. Yeah, exactly. Just like a factory <laughs> ramps up or ramps down production, a human being can do the same. And for the most part, that kind of stuff works. If it, as I mentioned with that recipro reciprocity is that if you treat people like adults, they often behave like adults. But if you treat yeah. people like kids or like cogs,
and they often react and behave in, in, in ways like that. And that, you know, which path do you want to go down? It's like that old adage about like, you have two wolves inside of you and you know, which one wins? It's the one that you feed, right? And so right. if you look at theories of management, how you treat people, well, you kind of get what you put in. It's like that old software thing of ego, garbage in, garbage out. If you treat people yep. like trash, they're going to treat you like trash. And if you treat them well, by and large, most people want to do a good job. They want to go home and they want to feel like they've actually contributed or accomplished something. And if you tap into that, as we talked about with the manufacturing and the ethics, um, yeah, I think that that literally everybody wins. There, there, there's not really a lot of times in life you can say there's no downsides, but really there's... I can't think of any downsides to unleashing more of people's people's innate potential. Yeah. So Stephen, as we wrap up, I, I mean, I could sit here and talk to you all day about this stuff, but as <laughs> we wrap up, um, what haven't I asked you that you want to share with the audience today? Um, well, there, there was that one anecdote I mentioned, uh, before we were recording about the, uh, manufacturing decline in the u.s mm. um because i think that's an important point um and i think that's something that that even people in the industry tend to kind of exaggerate like there, there's actually i was just looking up and that's the reason i brought it up is that there was an article in the wall street journal this is from march 1st of 2023 so just a few months ago and it said manufacturing's death has been greatly exaggerated and it's like america's manufacturers are still down beat but the worst might be behind them and, you know, it's talking about things like, you know, developing high-tech microchips and all sorts of other things. But there's, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to kind of realize that, that things might not be as doom and gloom as, as they appear to be. Because I, I was writing an article about manufacturing myths and, and, and other things of, of that nature. Uh, and one of the things I came across that was really eye-opening for me was that, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, I don't know why it was specifically them or whatever, but back in 2017, they had this article that they released. It's like, is U.S. manufacturing really declining? And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of graphs and a lot of charts, and you can find tons of resources online, like manufacturing share of employment from 1947 to 2015. It went down from 30 odd percent to just under 10. Uh, share of GDP, if you look at nominal GDP, it went from like, 25 to 30 percent now it's under 15 right and the the most interesting thing i mean i know it's not an economics podcast but like nominal and real gdp like real gdp looks at you know the time value of money and inflation and things and the fed looked at the share of manufacturing as a percentage of the real gdp of the u.s and from 1947 mm -hmm. to 2015 so a pretty large data set yeah given how relatively new manufacturing is in human history um, it's been pretty constant around 12%. So it's been like plus or minus one, two percent deviations and things like that. And I know 2015 now is eight years ago or whatever, but like that's 50 ish years or 60 years of data yeah. where it's been pretty constant. So I think, of course, there might be fewer people working in manufacturing, but that's true of a lot of industries. But that doesn't mean that the entire industry is in decline. It's just like saying, like, farming is in decline because 25% of people aren't employed as farm laborers. Well, yeah, that's true. And if you were a farmer, okay, maybe that hurt your livelihood, but it also moved a lot of people that were just like sharecropping or like, you know, those old pictures from the thirties and the, and the depression, like those people's lives were yeah. rough. I mean, they were rough in a way that we struggle to comprehend today. And, you know, working in a, in a, like, you know, having grown up in Detroit with the big three, like people that I know, that were working just, you know, average nine to five jobs, weekends off, you know, maybe some overtime here, whatever. Like back in the golden years, they had health care, they had dental cover, they bought a lake house up north, as we say in Michigan. Uh, and they did that with, you know, middle income, you know, whatever. They, they had pretty a luxurious life. And that was a change from the 1930s to the 19, let's say, 50s, 60s, 70s ish time frame. Yeah. Um, I don't think those people would have said, hey, that stuff, let's go back to sharecropping, right? So like some some people might have enjoyed that lifestyle and, and they didn't want to change. But I think most people were like picking strawberries is freaking hard. My back hurts. You know, my, my father grew up in Hungary and where he grew up, it's quite rural. And even though he was born 
during the Second World War, obviously the war left a lot of Europe quite devastated. And so people couldn't afford things like a tractor or whatever. So like he would go out in the field and my dad was a pretty powerful guy. Like he used to work out. I got my, my workout habits from him. Like he lifted weights even up until like a few weeks before he died. He was like lifting weights regularly and doing stuff. So he was a strong guy. He, you know, was working out his whole life. And he, he told me one time about like his dad went out to the field with a scythe, you know, one of those old things with the curved blade to like cut grass. And he was like, you would not believe the amount of effort it took to swing that thing. He was like, you know, he was like 18, powerfully built. And he was struggling like crazy. He goes after like 10 minutes, he thought, he's like, I thought my arms were going to fall off. I was sweating all over. Whatever. And my dad wouldn't be out there doing that all day. So, no kidding. you know, you can talk about, oh, the, you know, that, that tactile feeling and stuff. But to be honest, a lot of that stuff, it's grunt work and it's not, you know, you're talking about my poet, my, my poetic things. Like sometimes doing that manual work, your mind can wander and you can think of more esoteric things like, I don't know, theory of relativity or the beauty of <laughs> like the sunflowers or something like that. But for most people, it's just drudgery, right? Like it's, it's not work, again, that people aspire to be. It's people that it's work that people aspire to get out of or move beyond. Yeah. And, you know, my dad was a truck driver. You sit there for I don't know how many hours a day and you, you're dealing with traffic, which everybody loves. You, you, know, you have a larger <laughs> vehicle, so like the wind is more of an issue for you. Uh, you know, you have all kinds of things to deal with. Safety is bigger. You have to leave more distance. But people in cars often don't care, don't understand that. So they cut you off and then you've got to slow down and you're running late and then this and then that. If we have autonomous trucks, like is our truck driver going to be like, God, I miss the glory days of sitting on my ass for, you know, 14 hours a day and like listening to podcasts, right? Like, right. again, it's not, it's not glorifying work. I mean, people that work at like NASA or you know, SpaceX, they launch a rocket and they're like, sweet you know i did something i accomplished something but moving goods from point a to point b and I, look i'm not denigrating that work i'm just saying that for most people it's just a job yeah. and and they probably could be doing something a lot more i mean you hear all the time like oh i quit my office job or i quit this kind of job and i went and did this i became a a, a reiki practitioner or i started a yoga studio or i mm -hmm. did a clothing line like most people if they're given the opportunity would pick or choose to do something other than those type of jobs, those 3D jobs, yeah. those dehumanizing jobs. And, and as much advancement as manufacturing has made in the last few decades, we at Industrial Next feel like it's kind of stagnated, right? Like, like if you walked into a factory in the 80s and you walked into the factory in the 2020s, you'd see a lot of the same stuff. Yes, it's sleeker. Yes, it's faster. But fundamentally, there isn't a lot that has changed. And we're trying to drive that wedge in and, and, and bring some of that change that we've already seen in other places, especially the consumer electronics space has just exploded with innovation in the last 20 or 30 years. And we're trying to, to bring some of that same mentality and free people from this, this kind of, you know, crappier work that frankly, most people don't want to be doing. They wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't paying, paying their bills. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. And uh, along with that, their people strategies haven't changed a whole lot in the last 40 years either. Yeah. So, um, Stephen, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the anecdotes. Thank you for the wealth of information. Just pl uh, plain thank you. Uh, likewise, thank you, Jim, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm just glad to, I know we chatted a bit before the interview. I'm glad that, you know, you, you, you're a like-minded person. We, we chatted a little bit about things like office space and things like that. So like, yeah, I'm just happy that you're out there doing what you're doing. And I know podcasting is new for you, but I think, you know, it, it, it seems like you've really found a, a, a great niche and, and you're really passionate. And I'm just happy to be a part of what, what you're building. So thanks, thanks to you as well for, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, that's a wrap. Uh, it's been an absolutely eye-opening conversation. Uh, I learned a ton. I sat here and I, I always take notes, um, but I took four pages of notes today. So hopefully I can put those notes to good use. Uh, talk about the ultimate collision of technology and culture 
in our industry. Uh, we talked about Stephen's personal journey at Industrial Next and and prior to, to this organization, to the intricate dynamics of automation and its impact on company culture and inclusivity and diversion. It, we really, we covered it all. So whether you're navigating the choppy waters of employee engagement or simply steering the ship towards a tech savvy future, this episode is packed with the insights that you absolutely won't want to miss. If you love this whirlwind of a chat as much as I did, do yourself and your friends a favor, spread the word. Head on over to the manufacturingculturepodcast.com website for this and all of our other episodes that will really have you rethinking the way that we make products in this world. While you're there, don't forget to rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us bring even more conversations like this one to you. Share this episode with your colleagues, your boss, even your grandma. Let's get everyone in on the future of this industry. Um, and remember, a healthy culture doesn't just make for happy employees. It makes really for revolutionary breakthroughs. So until next time, have a great day and keep making things. Mm -hmm.